Hi, it's Steve Harvey Don. And in the United States, it's day two of the Library 2.0 and 3 conference. And this is our kickoff keynote for day two. Although it will surprise me if many in the audience are actually from the United States. Here on the East Coast, it's 3 a.m. On the Pacific Coast, it's midnight. Gene, what time is it in Singapore? Yeah, it's 3 p.m. in Singapore, so I'm wide awake. <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> Thanks to the conference sponsors and supporters. Thanks so much to San Jose State University as the founding conference partner. Three years now. Thanks to Follett, Blackboard Collaborative, EdWeb, and all of the organizations, some of whom are shown here, the rest are on the website who have been so supportive. This is actually a part of Connected Educator Month this year, or at least they're helping to support promoting the conference, and if you are participating in Connected Educator Month, you can actually get a badge for this session. At the end of the presentation, there will be a slide with the badge code and the link. This is a chance for those of you in the live room to let us know where, in fact, you are in the world. Look to the left of the map. You're looking for the star icon. You're going to click on it twice, and then you can click on the map. So I'm in North Carolina. I see New Zealand, Chambles, I'm now you're in Thailand. We have Singapore, so we started immediately with an international audience. And I'll let you keep putting, uh, well, you can put in the chat where you're located. There's a little bit of information. I'm sure Gene would enjoy that. But at this point, I'm going to turn the slide deck over to Gene. Gene, thank you so much, and we'll let you go from here. Thanks, Steve. Hi, everyone, um, all nine of you. I'm glad a lot of you are awake to listen to me. I have been thinking about the future of libraries for a very long time, and recently I started reading books on libraries and library history and reviewing the quotes of the library. And of course, we all know Ranganathan's every reader, his or her book. So I've been thinking about the concept of every reader, his or her book, to bring the book to the reader who needs it or who desires that. And we decided here to turn that on its head and to not so much provide a book for every reader, but perhaps to have a book about every reader. So the mantra we're going with right now is, every citizen his or her book. And that is the impetus of the Singapore Memory Project, which I'm sharing with you. And um, our ultimate objective is to build a Singapore Memory Public Library. And it will be a public library where every citizen will be able to find his or her book, or a book about his family, a book about someone he used to know, a book about his um, his ancestors, people who came before before him. It will be a book of lies, and it would also be a book of people who are gone. Yeah, I was just reading Neil Gaiman's um, article in The Guardian about how books are about the dead and how the dead can come alive. So let me explain this to you, uh, the Singapore Memory Project. What you're seeing on screen is an e-book about the playgrounds in Singapore. Playgrounds for kids have morphed into extremely safe, hazard-free playgrounds. These are the old playgrounds of the 1960s and 70s, and you could get hurt because they're made of concrete, they're made of sand. And we had a 29-year-old uh, artist who went around Singapore to lovingly document and to photograph each of these playgrounds. It became a major hit in Singapore, and one of the things that the Singapore Memory Project used on Facebook to enlarge its audience. The second picture that you see is an article we did on National Newspaper, and it's, there was a quote by the 29-year-old who contributed to that electronic book. Um, so even though we have about a million memories, um, what's important to me will be something, oh, by the way, that's me. That's my face. Uh, it's an article I did for the National Chinese Newspaper. What is important to us is to create, in a way, Book of Life, um, a book that will be an emotional 
uh, history of each individual's journey in Singapore. But we wanted this journey to be not nationalistic, it's not just about citizens of Singapore, but it's also about anyone who has ever experienced Singapore, and I hope some of you will have the opportunity to experience this country that I love. This particular picture is from a Malaysian newspaper, uh, and it was a blogger who had written something about Singapore because she had experienced Singapore. So I was in Kuala Lumpur and I saw this beautiful article when I woke up one morning. I was in the middle of a very, an extremely boring conference and feeling a little bit depressed. But when I turned, uh, when, I, when I flipped open the newspaper and saw this wonderful article, I saw that this blogger from Malaysia had been approached by us. Uh, through our blogger engagement initiative. We have been scouring for blogs that talk about Singapore. And we've been asking people to pledge their blogs to the project so that it can be proliferated and even more people can know about how the rest of the world feels about Singapore. So she was very pleased. And as you can see, she felt that this represents how serious the Singapore government is about preserving history in whatever form. So, how did the project start? The project uh, was announced by Prime Minister at the National Day Rally. This is, this is probably the most important speech in, uh, in the year for Singapore. So, to have uh, the Prime Minister announce this as a long-term program was something that gave the librarians who worked on this uh, a major, major surprise. And we were all very ecstatic about this. So he felt that this project, which is headed by the National Library of Singapore, is something that will help to pull together what he calls the tapestry of the nation. Uh, when he came, uh, when he talked about it a year later, and he looked at the memories that were collected at that point, he felt that all of these memories and all the content that we've gathered represented the soul of the nation. So let me, let me describe the project to you. This is uh, a classic long tale. And we were inspired by Chris Anderson from Why He did a book, an article, and then a book on uh, the long tail. So traditionally, for the National Library, we have collected things on the left of the chart. You can see the word major contributors. So there's a whole range of institutions at the National Library, National Archives, and also for major government institutions. And each of their contributions would number in hundreds of thousands. Uh, tens of thousands. So for this project, what we wanted to do is to tell the rest of the nation that uh, even if you only have one story, one memory to tell, uh, you could contribute that to the Singapore Memory Project. And it would be just as treasured as the mammoth collections that all the other agencies would give to us. In the long term, we feel that based on the classic long tail, uh, all these memories that come through, uh, perhaps shorter memories, perhaps memories that are not uh, published, would collectively become a much larger and possibly even more significant collection than those that we get from our traditional sources. So you can see from this uh, chart that I'm showing you, the whole range of content from what is existing on the far right, uh, far left, I'm sorry, which is content that's found on the internet, to content that is uh, not accessible through the internet, but that's already in the hands of institutions, partners, and individuals, to things that are only the hearts and minds of individuals. What we hope to do on the far right is for content to be content, for bibliographies, for guides, collections, and new research and productions, to be developed because of this effort by the National Library. I will share some of these uh, details with you. I am particularly concerned about where the world is going with social media. I think all librarians are, and I am extremely disturbed by something I think as the tyranny of singular thought, that people are thinking the same thing because it's been said many times on social media, and that particular thought is proliferated in social media and it gathers momentum like a snowball. 
I think libraries have a role to have a role to provide many more ways of seeing any particular issue. I have um, picked something that is representative of one of the most colorful and uh, most beautiful things that we have in Singapore. It's actually called the Hungry Ghost Festival. I don't have enough time to tell you how wonderful this festival is, but suffice to say that it is a festival where apparently all the ghosts of hell will be unleashed in that one month in July, and uh, they will be wandering all over Singapore. And what we do in order to entertain the ghosts so perhaps they will not wreak much havoc on our usual lives, is to perform and build beautiful shows like the one that you see. Uh, these are song and dance extravaganzas where the costumes are extremely loud and vulgar. When we look back at something like that, and I'm, I'm glad to say that it's still going on, uh, we sometimes see some of the younger things we use as something that is rather irrelevant to them. This is uh, a relic from the older generation. So a filmmaker called Royston, a uh, very talented filmmaker, who's a very young filmmaker, made it into a film called 881. So what is the Singapore Memory Project? From one of these triggers, 881, which is the trigger perhaps for the older generation, we hope to be able to expand the perspectives and to take, and to take the user through time. So from 881, which is a film by Royston, we hope you will be able to explore his first film. We hope you'll be able to see the fashion of uh, the stage of this Hungry Ghost Festival, and the stage is called Ge Tai. We hope you'll be able to go back to the places where these um, extravagances were first put up. Uh, we had several of these amusement parks, uh, one of which is called the New World, you can see in the top left-hand corner. And perhaps you can have a look at some of the personalities that uh, extremely colorful, like Liu Lingling, who was one of the major hosts of uh, the Hungry Ghost Festival. So through the Singapore Memory Project and through every memory, uh, we hope that you'll be able to expand your horizons and look at more and more of these perspectives so that for any one thing, there's almost like a Rashomon, this is a Kurosawa film, uh, way of interpreting and understanding any particular topic. But we felt it was important that we started with something more emotional, uh, which is your personal memory. And of course, personal memories are the most, uh, are, are the most unsexual of content items that the National Library can collect. And hence, it is the richest when it comes to interpretation. This is a very traditional view of history. It is a grand narrative that is linear in nature, what we hope to be able to do is to do a more constellation view of history, a constellation view of life. So there's an explosive and serendipitous ex exploration of things about Singapore, starting from your personal memory. So in the last two years, the Singapore Memory Project has uh, managed to get a large number of people to create wonderful things that in themselves are the genesis of many of these memory constellations that you saw just now. So for instance, we have filmmakers who have done uh, films of forgotten artists. We have uh, students who have gone around to collect memories. And I wanted to share this particular one with you, which is food. I'm not sure how many of you know Singapore well, but you would know that our national sport is food and eating. So what we did was uh, we engaged the most, um, the most eminent and popular blogger of food, as well as what he himself called uh, the godfather of blogs in Singapore, Mr. Brown. So together, we went on a 24-hour food trail, and the objective of this was to get uh, people to talk about food, the food of the past, as well as the food of today. Uh, this was backed by stories in our major newspapers, and it was a Twitter campaign as well. So the uh, participants had to had to eat at places that were uh, that were suggested by the Twitterers, 
it was a big hit and more importantly it generated conversations about Singapore and Singapore's food and all the memories associated with them. Uh, we also did a it's sort of like a Harry Potter concept. I, I'm not sure how many of you love Harry Potter. I'm obsessed with Harry Potter. So I thought perhaps if the kids of today, who apparently also read Harry Potter, could do something like the Daily Prophet, you know, that multimedia newspaper, um, I, I should say more a magical media newspaper. So what if kids could do that? So the kids uh, did this multimedia newspaper. And uh, we asked that they interview people older than themselves. One, one of the most interesting stories was uh, perhaps something that's unremarkable. They have uh, cleaning staff in every school. And one of the, one of the school students uh, sought out this particular cleaning lady who has been in the school for more than 30 years. And um, she, was, she was a little shell-shocked when they went to interview her. But they captured her story in great detail. Uh, and she had a very different perspective on how the school has evolved through the years. What I love about this is that um, her story would otherwise not be captured. It's not for the thing for memory project. Because she doesn't quite fit any particular profile or demographic or... She's not, she's not famous in any particular way. And in most cases, she would not be a candidate for an in-depth interview. I was very moved by her interview, and that's when I thought, these are the lies that we want to capture, because together, the traditionally remarkable and what is seemingly unremarkable lies could be, could be captured. This is our portal. I'm still working on it. Um, we wanted to give every Singaporean a permanent memory account. This is like a savings account, and uh, I think in America, Steve, you call it 401k or something like that. Uh, it, is, it is an account for every Singaporean to deposit their memories, and the National Library is determined to maintain this account through the generations. So through technological obsolescence, um, your children, uh, five generations from now, way after you are dead, would be able to view the memories of you and your family. So we thought the idea of a we concept to memory, uh, the, uh, that's, that's different from the big history, the winners of history concept of history, is something that National Library is determined to, to build. This is an app, and um, another, another angle that I've been exploring is the idea that the present is future memory. This is not a particularly new concept, but most people, when you think about memories, should think about distant memories. So this would be nostalgic Singapore. But we thought the present is as important, uh, and the present, of course, is history in the making. So we created an app for people to... Uh, capture memories as they happen, and to have these deposited into the permanent memory account that I talked about. This this is the um, Facebook pay, uh, post that I talked about, the playgrounds post. And for Singapore, which is a fairly small nation with about five million people, um, we reached a hundred thousand people in less than twenty four hours, and that is a phenomenal number for Singapore. But I felt what was more important than that, beyond the numbers, are the conversations that it generated. This project has become a um, crowdsourcing project. So the author has the author of the project, Justin, whom we supported, has created uh, an online database tracking the development of these playgrounds. So the general public would go in and they would be uh, typing in their spotting of each of these playgrounds. And um, sometimes, unfortunately, the demise of the playground. Um, and it is still growing. So this is one of the most um, moving things for me. This is the Twitter campaign that we did. It started with one of our sporting victories. Um, it was in the Malaysia Cup. That was in 1994. Uh, and we put out a video that 
many still consider the best goal ever scored by Singapore. It spun serendipitously into an amazing series of memories. 8,000 memories received in 24 hours. Again, this is Singapore. It was the number one trending topic. It trended above, I think, at that time, it was either Hunger Games or uh, the Twilight movies, which is a phenomenal deal. And 8 million impressions, and it reached uh, half a million visitors. But beyond the numbers, again, um, I had the same feelings that a lot of the Twitterers said. You can see from the comments here. So somebody said, it's wonderful. We are collectively memory keepers. And another person said that this is a public history project. It's wonderful. And it was also nice for the library once in a while that were just not were not just about knowledge, but also be able to um, just put a smile on someone's face. So you can see one of the, one of the comments, one of the tweets was about how this person is smiling to herself. It happened to be a rainy day, and she was just smiling to herself, reading all these memories. Sometimes you talk about bringing a nation together, and some of these efforts include uh, coming out with national songs, sometimes national dances, and stuff like that. But to me, this was an effort that put people together. And for all the vitriol that sometimes you see on the social media, it was nice once in a while to have something uh, beautiful that pulls people together. We have been collecting memories also from Facebook groups. And um, this particular effort was done because we felt that for the memories of today, there has been a lot of material shared on the internet and in social media. So we started a, a digital footprint project for people to pledge the memories that they have captured in Instagram and in Facebook and in blogs to the Singapore Memory Project. So at this stage, we have collected uh, about four to 500,000 of these. The idea is very much inspired by Intel's uh, Museum of Me where they captured the, where a person could see their entire uh, digital history captured in a museum-like environment. We wanted to do the same. It is almost like a library of me. Uh, so you could pledge your entire digital footprint and have, eventually, this is what I'm attempting to do, have a book that is uh, that's published based on everything that you've ever said on the internet. Conversations are important. I, I realize that a lot of people have been sharing their memories. There have been some books written, but they are all solitary exercises. So capturing memory in context beyond the first memory, the conversations and the interactions is something that uh, the National Library is very keen to do. So in a way, it's, it's, it's almost not like a publication per se, where you have just one conversation. It is conversations between the books of life that we are capturing. So in this particular one, you can see um, you can see a, a picture of national servicemen. This is the army that all males in Singapore have to go to at the age of 18 and serve for two years. Uh, a lot of collective memories there. And this is the, the, the cookhouse, the place where they eat. The conversations are captured and the tweets. Uh, we have started to archive tweets uh, that people share about their memories, and we are hoping to find a way to present these conversations uh, as part of the National Library's collection. I wanted to share these two with you, and possibly the one uh, on, the uh, on the bottom right, which is an interview that we did with CNN. Uh, a, a senior correspondent, David Gurian, was in Singapore, and I think he was just surfing a web, and he serendipitously came across the Singapore Memory Project. And um, he grilled me for one and a half hours, as well as two kids. And he asked me, he said, um, what have you learned from being involved in a project like that for the past two years? And I said, I have learned not to be arrogant. Um, Sometimes as civil servants, public public service uh, servants, and also as 
possibly librarians, uh, we have a certain view of the world and we wish to communicate that, organize that into a form that we feel people would understand. So we come up with categories, we come up with classification, and we would like people to have a very orderly way of understanding that content. Um, and so at the start of the project, I had certain profiles, like are these um, memories of certain traits in Singapore, certain sectors, industries, that sort of thing. But as I went through the project, I realized that every life that we interviewed was so specific. It is unfakeable because it was so, so specific. All the details, all the minutia of every life uh, was worth capturing because it is almost like an interesting novel. So what I told David, the CNN correspondent at the end of the day, is what I've learned from the Singapore Menu Project, besides not being arrogant, is to celebrate the mess, the messiness of it all. And uh, for the ordering of this messiness, I do hope that other people will be able to see that and to be able to find ways of representing that. So there will be many versions of the Singapore Memory Project uh, and many representations of that. I wanted to talk a little bit about the, what you see on the screen, the Chakya generation. Chakya is a, a kind of wooden clock that the older generation used to wear. It is extremely uncomfortable. But um, it is also, um, it, it's also extremely interesting because it represents uh, the whole culture of a generation that has now uh, entered into the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So beyond all the digital stuff that you see, we want to talk about the analog stuff. We started to go into the public housing estates where the older generation is, the older generation of Singapore is, and um, one particular one that moved me a lot was when we went to this particular estate called Tropayo, which is the second oldest estate in Singapore. Uh, we had a road show there, we had games, we put out a stall, uh, we had a video machine, and we, we just encouraged the residents to come by. So this Madam Cho saw the road show and asked what it was about. She had, she had lots of groceries. She took all the groceries, she took a bus home, and then when she came back, she had stacks and stacks of albums of her family photos. And there was one in particular of her parents' 1949 wedding. She uh, did a five-part video with us uh, of her memories. And at the end of the day, she, she, she said what she said. You can see the quote there. This is the first time that somebody has shown interest in my treasured memories. I was very, very moved by that. And I thought, the National Library could reach even just one person like that to make them feel that their memories and their stories are as worthy of being part of a National Library's, you know, eternal collection as anything else. Then I feel that we've done something good. Beyond that, we also felt it was it was it would be good for the younger generation to interface with the older generation. So to become storytellers and authors of the next generation. Uh, so we had one of our high schools uh, put together a cohort of 400 students, and they went to one of the older housing estates and interviewed 216 seniors. So it's two two kids to one uh, to one uh, member of the senior community. We also paired them with older volunteers. Our volunteers are called Memory Corps. They are, it's like the Peace Corps, except their role is to document memories. So together they captured a lot of beautiful memories. And what we've discovered is that in Singapore, there are far more people with stories than those who could write them well. So through this exercise, we hope to give that sort of attention and care to the stories that the Singaporeans would otherwise not have told. And the emotional journeys, we uh, have done some reunions of people who used to work together. This is actually our general post office, so we uh, put together three other staff and of course our first postmaster general, and they had a wonderful reunion. 
and the wonderful conversation which we captured. Uh, the Singapore, Singapore was built around what we call the um, Singapore River. So uh, one of the most iconic places were called, was called the Clifford Pier. One of the triggers that we used for the National Library was the place, the sense of a place. So we uh, captured the memories of many of these people who remembered Singapore through the Singapore River. You would notice that a lot of these, um, a lot of these interviewees are fairly old and fairly advanced. Uh, I remember what the CNN correspondent wrote to me. Let, let me try and get that. He said that he had a little bit of envy, and I asked him why. Why do you envy us? You're, you're from the United States of America. You're the you're the birthplace of Apple, and he said. What he has done is something we could not have done in 1776. Uh, we could not have done that, uh, captured the memories of the generation that built America, the founding generation. The founding generation of Singapore, Singapore was, uh, in, was independent from 1965. So we are focused on capturing the memories of those just before and after uh, the, independence, the, the year of independence. So that's 45 to 1975. This is to us uh, the National Library's gift to Singapore. And the gift is in the form of the gift of this generation that built Singapore. And technology has come to this point, and it is so wonderful for, for Singapore and for National Library. Technology is at a stage where we are able to capture these memories more quickly than any time in history. And it happened at a time when the generation that built Singapore is still with us. So with a lot of urgency, we are compiling these books of lives of Singaporeans so that we are able to build the Singapore Memory Public Library. Let me talk a little bit about the plans uh, for the future uh, from 2013, just this year onwards. We recently did a multimedia uh, project called HANDS where we captured the hands of um, 30 Singaporeans, and we had a wonderful exhibition on that. Um, we recently concluded the exhibition, and the people who went through the exhibition said that this was, uh, this was the most moving experience they've had. It, is, it was an emotional exhibition. Uh, when we did the launch, we invited all of the people to come, and there was a, there was a lady who was 106 year old, and her hands told the most amazing stories. We captured all of these, and what they're going to do is this is going to be the showpiece for the Singapore Memory Public Library that we're going to be building. Oh, I love this. This is uh, a poem that, uh, that a lady wrote of her mother, a poem that was a tribute to the mother. And um, it, was, it was such an emotional and yet creative enterprise so we've captured that, and this is part of the Singapore Memory Library. We've also worked with our TV, radio, online print because we realize that uh, there are there's a huge number of people not on Facebook. A lot of people are on Facebook, but a lot of people are not on Facebook. So um, we started a campaign called My Story, and a lot of these video stories have been captured beautifully by our TV station. And uh, these stories will form the basis for something we'll be doing very soon. I'll, I'll come to that very, very soon. Our National Day Parade, um, again, an occasion of great pride uh, for the celebration each year of our independence. So we partnered with the National Day Parade to collect memories. So we had memory call go around the 60,000 people to interview them and to capture their memories. These are the ebooks. So if you are interested, these are all available on our Singapore Memory uh, portal, singaporememory.sg. You can download them. They are currently in PDF forms, but I'm working on making these enhanced books. Uh, these are done by local art artists and writers, and a lot of them capture a slice of Singapore that is not often celebrated. This is a memory kit. Uh, we just done a print version, but we are making uh, short video versions of these that will be going out. It's almost like the 101 
of um, how to build memories. So we have uh, lessons on oral history, we have lessons on video memories, uh, blogging, and even lessons on how to interview someone that you love. And all of these are written not just by experts, but by, by members of the Memory Corps. You know the Peace Corps volunteers, Memory volunteers? So they, uh, they, they tell their stories of catching memories, so it becomes something that's achievable, that you don't have to be a world-class writer and you don't have to be a poet laureate to be able to capture a memory in all its detail. We started a fund because um, in spite of all our best intentions, there are just far too many people out there in the founding generation of Singapore for us to capture. And I am extremely nervous that in one generation, that generation would go. So we have uh, created a fund called I Remember SG Fund. Our Facebook page is I Remember SG. I like that because it's more personal. Uh, so in, in preparation for our celebration of our 50th anniversary in 2015, uh, we have launched the fund. We've, we've had a lot of proposals coming in. There are proposals where, um, where ladies' lunch clubs would be uh, pulling themselves together to capture the memories of older people. We have a 3D printing memory service that was proposed. They would uh, do 3D versions of things that we used to love that may not exist anymore. And we have a group of artists who would like to sketch from memories all the places that we used to love in Singapore. Okay, finally. The Emotional Journey of Being Singaporean. This is a showcase I'm planning for 2015. Uh, all these memories of unremarkable people will be collected and built into a digital footprint. And this will be at the National Museum of Singapore. I believe this will be the first time something that is about the citizens of Singapore, not something that is tied to major events, major history, uh, would go into the hallowed halls of a national museum and be celebrated like the most beautiful artwork you can see. So what I hope to do is to be able to uh, have people walk through a space which will unfold in time. I am I'm hoping, and this is my this is my objective almost. I'm hoping that people would be moved. And one of the inspirations for me for this project is my mom. So um, she belongs to the founding generation. And I hope that when she goes through this space and she stands still and looks at the space, she would be able to see a, a movie of her life, of all the places that she has been to, because of certain keywords that she would put into the machine. Um, it will come together as a sequence of scenes from her past. This is what I, I hope I'll be able to achieve. And um, one of the inspirations for this, and uh, this, this is quite weird because this is a film that I think almost nobody has seen. It is um, a film called Vans, V-A-N-P-S. It is by Amy Heckerling, who used to do uh, great films like Coolers and... Uh, Fast Times in Richmond High. I said used to because she's done really horrible films, and Dance is a horrible film. But the ending of that film is so phenomenal. Uh, Alicia Silverstone, who is the star of the film, is a vampire. And at the end of the film, she uh, decides that she's had it. She, she wants to die, and she found a way to die. So as she was dying, her friends asked her where she would like to go. So she said, I would like to go to Times Square. So she went to Times Square, she stood there, and as the pieces of her started to float into the air, because you know, she was dying, um, she saw Times Square unfold in 200 years. I mean, from the time when she first became a vampire to the present time. This is what I hope to achieve. It's a time travel to Singapore from a personal perspective. And uh, as I said, this is going to be an uh, experience. It's in a drawn light space, and I hope to be able to uh, to be able to have this as not a solitary experience, but an experience that we can share. So each person who enters the space has the ability to 
create an experience based on her personal journey, and the rest of the participants will be watching the movie of her life. Okay, so this is my last slide, uh, and it is a picture of that wonderful lady's parents. Remember the lady in the, in the public housing estate, the one who ran home, put down her groceries, and got her albums out? Well, this is a picture of her parents. Her parents now, and her parents then. And this was the, um, uh, this, this is the uh, inspiration of her five-part video story, which is also available uh, on the Singapore Memory Portal. Uh, and I thought, this is it. The Singapore Memory Project by the National Library is about collecting that personal meaning one at a time, putting it into the national collection, and hopefully from that seed of memory, they would be connected to the extremely rich content and collections that the National Library has in Singapore. I think that's all I have. So um, I'm happy to take any questions or perhaps we could just have a conversation. Thanks, Steve. Okay, I don't know if you could see the chat, Jean, while you were speaking, but for those of us who are here feel a little privileged to have heard you tell this story. How moving. Oh, thanks, Steve. Yeah, I saw the T-shirt. Yes, we do have a T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> so if you have a question for Jean, please feel free to put it in the chat. Uh, or if you'd like to raise your hand, I'm going to turn the microphone privilege on and we'll let you ask him a question. I'm really interested in the archival piece of this, especially as you've gathered so much data and the difficulty with which we, the difficulty we have in uh, storing things in such a way as to know they'll be around in 20 years, even if it's electronic. Um, what have you, what kinds of thoughts have you had about how do you make sure that um, the material stays around? I think we, we have been archiving these um, digitally and uh, we're treating these the same way as all the other digital collections. So we are also migrating them through time, but this is digital. I am hoping, and this sounds a little weird, but I'm hoping to also have these uh, produced in print and to have them progressively renewed in print uh, because I think there are people who still uh, like the idea of a library of books. So even, lo even though we are also archiving these digitally, uh, we are uh, thinking of producing this progressively through print and, and renewing them. And I'm oh, not yeah, sure just, if that's a full. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I just saw a question on searchability, and I think, yeah, this is from a friend in Thailand. He's asked this before. Yes, um, the content is searchable. We have put about 250,000 of these memories online. Um, we are still working out, uh, putting on uh, the stuff from social media, the tweets, as well as the Facebook posts. We are still working on that. Those should be online fairly quickly. Uh, because our site currently is not enabled to search these, uh, but that should be changed in about a year. But currently, all the other memories, 250,000, are searchable online at singaporememory.sg. And what I also hope to do is that each time you make a search on our website, uh, besides the memories and related memories that you, uh, you can find, we will also propose other content from the collection. So this could be newspaper articles and stuff like that. Yeah, sorry, Steve, you're going to say. Um, no, you didn't interrupt. I'm, I'm really interested in the story core group. And um, has there been any effort to transcribe, say, old family journals or uh, old family pictures? I guess this is obviously an old family picture, but where the story core is actually interviewing their own ancestors? Yes, we, we are encouraging that. In fact, the I remember SG Fund is supporting some of these family uh, family biographies. Uh, there's one that's just been written, and we're going to publish it pretty soon. Uh, it is about it is an, actually a full book 
of uh, this gentleman and his family growing up in one of the areas. There is another one that was really beautiful. It was um, it was one that the Nanny Kaur did of her dying father-in-law. So before he died, they knew that he had a terminal uh, illness. Uh, she did everything she could to capture the memories of those around him. And um, okay, this is a bit this is a bit macabre, but uh, at his wake, uh, the book was published and it was given to everyone who attended. This is just fascinating. Um, Shambles asked another question about languages. <laughs> yes, I love Shambles. Uh, we, uh, okay, the, the entry for singaporememory.sg, the entry few accepts all languages. Uh, but what I'm doing is I'm starting a project called uh, a multilingual map of Singapore, memory map of Singapore. I know it's a mouthful. I'll try and find the name. So uh, this is still work in progress. So the new website will have a map of Singapore that cuts through time and through languages. So for every location in Singapore, we are going around to capture uh, memories of that of that place. In fact, because Singapore is so multilingual, any particular place in Singapore would have, uh, besides its official names, several names in not just the four languages, Tamil, Malay, Chinese, and English, but also in the dialects, for instance, of the, of the Chinese language. So there are several of these dialects. So we are working around with um, all the communities on the ground to uh, have all these stories written in the different languages, and then for that to be searchable. Um, we, this is a mammoth task. I, I don't expect this to be done next year, but we hope to at least have a spot to that in 2015. So um, if you can do that, it will be a time travel multilingual map. Uh, we're putting together pictures, not just from the community and from individuals, uh, but also from our entire National Archives, National Library, and also from the planning authorities who have agreed to come on board with their thousands of photos. And conservationists, place historians are also on board to help us to find the people who can speak in the particular, uh, particular language of all those uh, memories. So again, if you have a question, feel free to put it in the chat or to raise your virtual hand, which is the hand icon in the participant box. Yeah, I'm Are you aware of any other countries doing similar efforts? I I believe a lot of countries have started memory projects. Uh, the Netherlands had the memory of the Netherlands project, which is simply beautiful, and got the American memory project. I think several countries have started this, uh, and they were inspirations for the Singapore memory project. I, I'm not sure whether they've gone in the same direction. Uh, but those are all inspirations for us when we started. I know that Hong Kong is uh, beginning a memory project, and I'm going over about a month, a month's time to have a chat with them. Uh, the Chinese uh, want to start a memory project as well. So it seems to be a, a wave of nostalgia <laughs> across the world and across all the libraries. And I think that may be it. Okay. Thank you so much. I was just captivating. I'm. Uh, I know the time difference is such that it would have been hard for you to present during our day, but I think this is a, <laughs> uh, this has been a terrific experience for me personally. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, it's been wonderful for me as well, and it's nice to be in a conversation in a small room with, with 
wonderful people and wonderful and just wonderful talk and reinforcement of what we're doing. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Dean. Thanks, everybody. I am going to put up the page for the Connected Educator Month badge, um, and we'll leave that up for a minute. Um, well, I feel I feel better for having attended.